Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. We would like to introduce you to aseptic technique in the oral surgery operating rooms and indicate the manner in which you conduct uh, yourself and the patient is handled in order to preserve the sterility uh, of the armamentarium and the equipment as we work in this clinic. You'll see that I am attired in a scrub shirt, which you will put on when you come to the clinic. It is laundered and clean. It has not been autoclaved. Uh, it will also have a name tag which will identify you and you will wear a cap. Uh, these are also laundered for each uh, occasion and the tie is in the back and this will prevent uh, loose hair uh, from coming out and uh, getting into the operative field or the areas that we are considering sterile. Modified caps for other hairstyles are also available. But in this manner we uh, will present our patient. On some occasions you will have a cold, upper respiratory infection, or your patient may have an upper respiratory infection. In that instance, you'll use a face mask covering your nose and mouth. Uh, it has a small metal band which can contour over the bridge of the nose, and it's tied back both above the occiput and below, down on the neck. And in this manner, you will protect yourself and you'll protect your patient from the exchange of pathogens uh, in the operation that you're carrying out. So if you have a cold or your patient has a, a severe upper respiratory infection or there's any other reason, sometimes in certain types of surgery that are more vulnerable to contamination than others, we also put on a uh, face mask. When you are then in the clinic, your patient will enter and uh, the assistant or nurse will bring in the patient and the patient's records. And uh, those are kept on this shelf. And uh, the patient's belongings uh, will be placed in the cabinet in the shelves that are down below. We'll leave that open for a moment just to show you that in addition to the storage of the patient's belongings on the bottom shelf, this cabinet contains a number of other containers and supplies. To control the hair in the uh, operating field, a cap is placed over the head. This uh, both protects the patient's uh, head from any possible uh, contamination from the previous headrest uh, user and also controls the hair so that it does not get attracted to your hands as uh, you are operating uh, with gloves where static electricity tends to attract uh, hair. The uh, draping of the patient proceeds with a sterile drape which will go over the front, you notice how it's being handled, that the exposed surface <coughs> is not contacted by the assistant, uh, and that area will remain sterile. Patients should be instructed not to touch the front of the, this uh, drape, which uh, is remain sterile. You might say, well, those are the patient's own organisms, and it doesn't matter, but the flora on the hands is different from that of the mouth, of course, and we try to preserve that zone of sterility. Before uh, we proceed, we will look at the records and uh, each patient will come in to you with a complete uh, record of this sort. And the front sheet will contain the identification aspects and the radiographs will be here. The radiographs are mounted and are placed in a view box which is located here and they then will be available for your careful review as you get to the radiographic section of the patient's records. As you approach the patient for a tentative preliminary examination, before your hands are prepped for the aseptic technique that we will be discussing in just a moment, we will 
step over to the area of the sink where sterile tongue blades are maintained and we're able to pick one of those off without contaminating this end of the blade that's going into the patient's mouth. And we'll then proceed with a preliminary cursory evaluation of the oral cavity, checking out for the correlated symptomatology and the findings. We'll conduct a cursory preliminary examination then entirely uh, of the mouth and jaws. And after our hands are prepped, we will go into a more thorough palpation uh, and evaluation of the area. But for the preliminary entries on the clinical examination of the oral cavity, this would be the approach. And uh, we then would turn to the preparation of our hands. You notice I just discarded the tongue blade in one of the waste receptacles uh, that is here. In the preparation of the hands, we use gloves in oral surgery. The gloved hand provides a surface which is uh, readily uh, prepared since it lacks irregularities and porosity. It is prepared with the hexachlorophene uh, soaps and detergents that are used and can be very rapidly re-scrubbed. And it is primarily for this purpose that we operate in a gloved hand condition. A second rather important uh, to you reason for operating gloved uh, is that the gloved hand protects the operator. And when we are working with sharp instruments and around irregular teeth, and particularly around areas that are often infected, uh, it is appropriate that we protect our hands uh, in these instances. Uh, the organisms from hepatitis virus on through the common bacterial pathogens that you'll encounter in abscesses, these things need your own protection as well as the protection of other patients that come to oral surgery clinics. So when you're dealing with these in contaminated conditions, we should do everything we can to pr preserve sterility uh, of the field. We'll look at the preparation of gloves now. Gloves uh, are purchased uh, ordinarily. Uh, the size of your glove is the same or a half size smaller than dress gloves. Uh, rubber gloves are uh, purchased in this, this particular form and the surface should be powdered. Uh, this powdering of surface allows the entry of the hand in a simplified uh, manner rather than getting hung up on the glove surface itself. In a hospital operating room, the gloves are autoclaved. These gloves are just clean. And that is the primary difference. And you will be working with clean gloves, the surface of which will be uh, scrubbed for the given case. We'll demonstrate simply how the powder is applied. It is sprinkled on the gloves without any great volume. And the, it is worked into this, this outer surface of the glove. After the exterior then of the glove has been powdered, the outside is powdered, the inside is not. These gloves then are simply inverted. They're turned inside out so the powdered surface gets in. If you then close the cuff of the glove, you trap some air, and that air can be used to extend the fingers of the glove outward. So we now then have powder on the inside so that the hand will slide into that rather well and we'll do the same thing with the other glove and we then will have gloves that have inside powdered surfaces uh, that are going to admit the scrubbed hands much more readily so we'll return to these gloves in a moment after we have scrubbed our hands as you are preparing your hands in surgery uh, we'll go over to the scrub sink which is located in this corner it is operated by this knee control, which avoids any use then of the prepared hands in controlling the uh, water supply. As you begin the preparation of your hands, any rings and jewelry should be removed from the forearm and hand and uh, placed to one side, preferably in your pocket so you don't forget them. We'll then begin the scrub of the hands and this will depend upon the relative initial cleanliness of the hands. These tissues are 
impregnated paper, paper that has been impregnated with hexachlorophene uh, detergent soap, and they will supply both a surface uh, on which to scrub and a supply of soap. So we will begin the hand preparation. You will have previously cleaned your nails uh, of any gross dirt, and uh, if your hands are particularly soiled, you may wish to begin the introduction with the use of a scrub brush as well. Those are in each of the operating rooms, and you can use that as a preliminary scrub. This will be then the preparation of the hands. As you are scrubbing, it is important that once you've started the preparation of your hands, that uh, you get into all surfaces, get in between the fingers and uh, around the wrists and into the upper forearm. As the soap is rinsed off, rinse it in a manner that the water drains down toward and off of the elbow, rather than keeping the hands down so it drains the other way. Your prime purpose here is the preparation of the hands, not the elbows. So your hands should remain as clean as possible throughout this preliminary scrub. This is much abbreviated from what it would be in the operating room because you are not going into sterile gloves. So your hands are clean now and we'll dry the hands in this manner, taking a paper towel from this container. Again, keep the hands high. Sometimes more than one towel is necessary to get them dry. And we will then will prepare this skin surface by applying more powder. The powder that we'll use on the hands is packaged in a cream form, and that's located here in these packs. These packs are then torn open. They have an inner package that we will obtain. And in this inner package is the tube-like cream powder. And you can see that this cream powder then is just expressed on the hands. It's one way of controlling powder so that it doesn't spread all over the room in a big cloud. Uh, the powder then is applied to the hands. It dries very rapidly. The vehicle is a uh, rapidly vaporizing solution so that the hands now are covered with powder and we will return to these gloves that we had prepared. And now with a powdered hand surface and an inner powdered glove surface, there is no difficulty in sliding the gloves onto the hands. So we'll grasp the glove at its cuff, insert the hand inside the glove, and pull it on well up over the wrist so that each of the surfaces is covered. Now we have <coughs> hands that are clean, inside of clean gloves, but the cleanliness of these gloves needs to be improved by another preparation. Now we are covered with this surface that is rapidly prepared, unlike skin, and we can very rapidly prepare it again here at the scrub sink. We'll return the scrub sink, wash these surfaces, select another physohex tissue, and proceed with the preparation of the gloved hand. When we conclude this preparation, you can see the lather works up quite readily, and we very quickly will cleanse this rubber surface of all organisms. If during our work we should contaminate our hands, this procedure then is rapidly repeated. Once the gloved hands have been prepared in this manner, they should be kept away from you and above your waist. Do not 
let the hand drop below waist level where it can accidentally get contaminated. You have now a gloved surface that is quite clean and we can proceed uh, to operate in the field and to look at the tray where the sterile instruments uh, will be kept. I'd like to suggest that this is a standard tray setup. And when you enter the oral surgery clinic, one of the assistants will have prepared this area by covering it with a double uh, thickness of autoclaved linen and uh, in a tray cover. We'll have selected the suction hose that you see here and have set out a cup filled with sterile water uh, and uh, an irrigating uh, bulb. The paper cup is for disposable items such as uh, the anesthetic carpules and ampules so that they do not get left out in the tray to be accidentally uh, broken and allow broken glass to be carried back into the operating field and accidentally uh, lacerate the uh, patient. So this is one place where that type of material will be discarded. Uh, suture needles, uh, other extracted teeth that are going to be discarded, uh, anything like that goes in that waste receptacle. Here uh, are our initial supply of sponges. We will use these in many aspects in surgery uh, for the hemostasis that's necessary in certain parts of the examination. We can proceed further with the examination with the mouth mirror. And we would then do that, completing the inspection and the palpation of the field to make any additional entries on the uh, examination findings for this particular patient. After arriving then at our diagnosis and a treatment plan, we are ready to increase the instrument armamentarium for the particular case at hand. And to do that, we select the instruments that are provided for you and for your use uh, in oral surgery from the cabinet area where they are kept sterile. The cabinet, as you see, is provided with two transfer forceps that are located here. One of these has been placed for this particular patient. That is labeled patient forcep. The other is the general room transfer forcep. Both forceps have completely sterile beak areas, these areas out here. However, the handles on this one uh, are clean for this particular patient. And uh, so we can use this transfer forcep work on the patient, select another instrument if we need it, uh, and do not have to scrub our hands again. They are kept uh, protected in those tubes. The other transfer forcep is available for others that come in the room whose hands have not been prepared. So that if an assistant comes in and you ask her for something, she can use the room transfer forcep and obtain the instrument and uh, put this back without contaminating uh, this area. The sterile instruments are kept in this cabinet. Uh, the cabinet is kept covered to keep uh, dust, debris, and contaminants uh, out. And as we would think about the procedure that is planned, we would select the instruments from the beginning to the end of our uh, operative procedure and then close the cabinet. We would select, for example, uh, a curette, a double-ended curette, to check for soft tissue uh, anesthesia around the necks of the tooth that's to be removed. As we bring the instrument over to the bracket tray, we will not touch the bracket tray with the transfer forcep. Instead, we will drop it like that. If we inadvertently, after working on this patient, and bringing this patient's organisms and pathogens back to this tray area, if we touch that tray area with this transfer force at beak, we therefore will carry those organisms the next time we use this instrument back into this sterile area of the cabinet, which we definitely wish to avoid. 
we'll go through some of the contamination traps, uh, accidents that you can have. We would uh, indicate that this sterile water uh, is dispensed if we wish to irrigate the field uh, by filling the bulb and then to control more specifically the place where the fluid will uh, be directed. These small tips are used and whenever you're connecting tips into rubber equipment, if you moisten both of them, they'll slide in a little more readily. Uh, this then is the way in which this uh, dispenser of sterile water is held. And if you hold the bulb in your hand like this and just grasp the tip between uh, index finger and thumb, you can squeeze the bulb and direct the stream exactly where you wish it to go. The suction uh, is here and the suction tip once again, if moistened, will slide into this tubing more readily. And here you have then the aspiration uh, equipment ready to go. The aspirator has a hole in it. The maximal negative pressure is obtained if you put your finger over the hole, uh, then that's maximum aspiration. For some areas that are rather delicate where you don't wish to have the same volume uh, of uh, aspiration, then you may uh, wish to decrease the negative pressure by taking your finger off of the hole uh, for that particular part of the operation. The uh, suction is operated by the control knobs down below this stand. Therefore, to turn on the suction equipment, you would either request that the assistant uh, do this by turning this knob open uh, or in the event that you had to do it yourself, you'd need to re-scrub because that is one of the places where uh, we can have a source for contamination. Returning to the tray for a moment, there are times when you may contaminate an instrument and it may need to be replaced. Uh, let us, for example, state that we have contaminated the tip of this suction uh, by hitting it against uh, the chair or someplace. We'd want to discard that and we'd would discard it into the instrument sink that is over on the wall opposite uh, the scrub sink over here. The contaminated instrument is then gently discarded in the sink without your touching the contaminated sink area. While we are here, you'll notice this covered pitcher, which is the source of the sterile water that is used in the cup uh, on the sterile bracket tray. When you run out of sterile water, this is the reservoir that is used. The handle of this is contaminated and uh, it will be necessary for you to re-scrub after you refilled the cup. With these contaminated hands, if we wanted to get a uh, few more sponges before we re-scrubbed, we would not use the patient forcep. We could, however, use the general room forcep, come over here to this uh, drawer and obtain a new uh, supply of sponges and drop them over here, close the drawer again, and return this general room for them. Now our hands need to be re-scrubbed. We'd return to the scrub sink. We'd go through the same operation that we had uh, carried out before. And uh, as you run into these contamination pitfalls, your guard is kept up because each time you have to re-scrub, and that uh, is time consuming. Among some of the contamination pitfalls that are here uh, is the preservation of the sterile areas. The most uh, important of these is this bracket tray, and where you're uh, using additional or uh, unusual equipment, such as a biopsy bottle, uh, you don't bring that biopsy bottle in, as we could show here. The biopsy bottle or paper is not put on that tray. If it is, it contaminates the whole thing. So don't let anybody come in and place contaminated equipment on this sterile tray where you're going to continue to work on the patient. The other potential pitfall for contamination, the biggest one of all, would be the contamination of the interior of this supply cabinet. If you reach in there with your hands, uh, if you contaminate it with a 
a transfer forklift that it carries uh, organisms in, then the entire uh, supply has to be removed, the entire cabinet taken down, all instruments re-autoclaved, and uh, this is the cardinal sin in the breaking of the aseptic technique uh, here in oral surgery. The uh, other possibilities, as we mentioned earlier, are letting your hands drop down to your sides, touching your clothing, pulling out uh, fountain pens, uh, writing uh, in areas, and then going back to the field. We wish to avoid these uh, potential contamination traps. The handles of the light have been prepared by scrubbing them down again with Fisohex in between the patients so that this part has had a hexachlorophene scrub. Other parts of the light have not been prepared and are potentially a zone of contamination. So when you grasp the light, grasp it just on the handles that have been scrubbed down and you'll avoid that source of contamination. The buttons on the chair for changing chair position are uh, scrubbed down between each patient again with hexachlorophene. Would then be at uh, hopefully preserving aseptic technique We'd be at the conclusion of the procedure and we'd be ready to dismiss the patient. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.